guys. Hi. Thank you so much for, so coming, much for coming. And thanks for that lovely introduction. Yes. OK, uh, we also wanted to give a special shout out to Google Docs, uh, without which this collaborative book would never have been written. Seriously. Seriously. Yeah. At one point, we were in two different countries. Um, that's how you write a book together, in two different countries. So thank you uh, to any folks here. And this presentation is actually on Google Slides. We didn't do that just because we were coming to Google. <laughs> we didn't. We legit are fans, so thank yeah. you. Um, OK, so we want to talk about how Ruth Bader Ginsburg won the internet and why it matters. And I want to start out by setting a scene for you. It's June 2013. It's the last week of the Supreme Court term. As many of you know, that is the week that the most important decisions come down. On this particular day, the Voting Rights Act is on the chopping block. As you may know, this is one of the most important pieces of civil rights legislation. Chief Justice John Roberts has the opinion. And he says, any racial discrimination in voting is too much, but our country has changed in the last 50 years. Uh, we have a comic in the book that uh, depicts this argument as, LOL, racism is over. Um, now, something that's uh, customary in the court bringing its opinions is that the Chief Justice uh, will say, Justice Blank has the opinion. And that opinion will be read by the justice who wrote the opinion, in this case, the Chief Justice himself. The impact of this decision was to gut an important provision of this piece of civil rights legislation that made it. Uh, this piece of legislation, which was referred to as preclearance, forced states with discriminatory histories to bring their uh, laws, their changes in their voting laws, to the federal government ahead of time so that the federal government could monitor whether these would have a discriminatory impact, especially on historically oppressed groups. So by undermining this piece of legislation, by saying that it was no longer needed on a very questionable legal grounding, Essentially, it was opening the door and has subsequently opened the door for more racial discrimination in voting. So in this case, Justice Ginsburg has a dissent. And like Irene mentioned, it's customary for the majority opinion to be read from the bench. But what's more unusual is for a dissent to be read from the bench. And in this case, Justice Ginsburg decided to read her dissent out loud. And not only that, she had actually done so twice before in the same week, once in a case regarding affirmative action and once in uh, combined two cases involving workplace discrimination. Now, this is unusual, and she actually broke Supreme Court records with the number of uh, oral dissents that she gave that week. And in this case, when you read the dissent from the bench, it means something. It, it, it has an import. It sends a message. And that message is that something is wrong. It's so sounding the alarm. It's like, um, as the New York Times actually put it, it's like embarrassing your spouse at a dinner party in front of the guests. So in this case, I was in my second year of law school. I was going into my second year at that time. And as a future public defender, I was appalled at the gutting of this central tool for racial justice advocates. So everyone I knew was sort of angry about what was happening on the court, but the light amidst this anger was Justice Ginsburg's words. This is a court sketch that was uh, drawn live, which we actually include in the book. And if you look around Justice Ginsburg's neck, uh, a, a funny thing about uh, a, a light thing that we include in the book is that a lot of people recognize uh, these uh, neck collars that she, the jabots uh, or necklaces that she wears with her judicial robes. Many people don't know that she chooses them based on what her opinion is that day. So this is her dissent jabot. Yes. So if she comes out to the bench wearing this spiky, aggressive, sparkly dissenting collar, it's bad news for liberals because she's about to dissent. And her words in this case, one of the most famous lines, was actually the first post on the notorious RBG Tumblr. Throwing out preclearance when it has worked and is continuing to work to stop discriminatory changes is like throwing away your umbrella in a rainstorm because you are not getting wet. 
And we think uh, that Justice Ginsburg's clear words, which speak to people who are not just attorneys and are fierce and reasoned at the same time, are part of the reason why she has drawn so many people to her. Uh, this is such an elegant analogy that uses absolutely no legal jargon to draw people's attention to what was a major upending of a core civil rights law. And so when this case came out, I was inspired by Justice Ginsburg's words. And at the same time, I had already taken con law as a 1L constitutional law. I knew about Justice Ginsburg's work as an advocate at the uh, Women's Rights Project of the ACLU. And I knew something about her story, her life story. And I realized there was no space on the internet that was just dedicated to celebrating this amazing figure in our, in our history. And so I figured what better way to celebrate her than to juxtapose her with a larger than life figure uh, in our history as well, the late, great, notorious B.I.G. So I started a Tumblr and I designed a t-shirt and this is, uh, as you can see, this was the first Notorious R.B.G. t-shirt and let's just say that it, it took off. Yeah, to say the least. Here's an iconic image of Biggie Smalls uh, that has uh, found its way onto our book cover. And uh, in the center are some, uh, th those posters and stickers blanketed Washington, D.C. on the same week that we're talking about, June 2013, uh, the week of the Shelby County decision and the other oral dissents that we mentioned that also uh, concerned civil rights and remedies to discrimination. And the middle image is uh, Can't Spell Truth Without Ruth, and it's a Basquiat crown, so definitely taking this kind of uh, 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 vernacular of the hip hop movement. Uh, and that's a little plug for our t shirts, uh, the Notorious RBG t shirts. That's my little brother. <laughs> nail art. There is Ruth Bader Ginsburg nail art. There's also art, art. This illustration is in the Times today, by the way. We were all very excited. Mm -hmm. this, this is actually called, that one is called Ruth Bader Ginsburg Smiting Her Enemies which, um, as I tried to explain in, in my op-ed in the New York Times this weekend, she would never do, she would just very gently argue with her enemies, but she would smite them with the force of her reason. Right, she, she likes to say that the way that you take down your adversaries is by painting their arguments in the best light possible, and then... Knocking them down. down. Yeah, so there was also embroidery and needlepoint. Legos. We actually got a chance to meet the RBG Lego and, and her creator uh, yesterday. Yes. Like, uh, like Justice Ginsburg herself, small but powerful. Mm -hmm. And as mentioned, lots of Halloween costumes. We're thinking about doing a contest this year. Yes, keep us in mind when you're choosing your Halloween costumes. Mm -hmm. Tag us, Notorious RBG. And of course... Weekend update. <laughs> you got Gins burned. Kate McKinnon, the brilliant tattoos. Several tattoos. But Justice Ginsburg is still, after all, an 82-year-old Jewish grandmother. This yeah. was her reaction to seeing tattoos in her face. <laughs> she said, uh, this is in my interview with her, she said, why would you do that to yourself? It's permanent. <laughs> and actually, another occasion in which I saw her, she, she had just read the book, and, and she said, you know, there's something I have to tell you. And I was so worried, you know, she has famously high standards. And she said, listen, no one should ever get a tattoo of me. This has gone too far. <laughs> so why is it that people of our generation have become so excited about Ruth Bader Ginsburg, almost obsessive? Was it just a passing meme, <laughs> like menswear dog or lol cats? <laughs> I, I love menswear dog, uh, but I think that this is something, there's something more going on here than just fun memes. I think uh, specifically what Justice Ginsburg has devoted her life to and what she represents at a moment in which important civil rights laws and the women's rights gains that she had devoted her career to are on the chopping block at a point in which there are still too few women in positions of authority and power. 
she is a woman who has devoted her entire career to bringing along other women and other people who are uh, historically disadvantaged. She has done so with intellectual integrity, with grace, and as we learn from writing this book, she knows of which she speaks. The causes she's devoted her life to have also inflected her own life. So obviously, Ruth Bader Ginsburg is more than just a hilarious Jewish bubby who uh, talks about getting drunk at, on California wine before the State of the Union address. Um, that was the, the reason she gave for why she fell asleep at the State of the Union. But we also know that, in fact, she was up all night working before. She's a famous night owl. So she often gets about two hours of sleep, even, uh, even to this day. And we, you know, we have so much to learn from her. And we're so in, her, in debt to her. So we wanted to bring what we learned about her in writing this book to, to you guys and, and to everyone who, who, who are able to read it. Um, first of all, her, her life story is absolutely fascinating. She's gone through so much. She actually, her sister died when she was six years old, so she ended up being an only child after that. And her mother passed away the day before her high school graduation. Where she was scheduled to speak. And she ended up not attending as a result. Um, in law school, she went to Harvard Law with her husband, who was a year above her. She had a one-year-old child when she started. And at, in addition to all of that, she, her husband actually got cancer while they were in law school. And I think she, we have a photo of them together. Yep, and, and she actually would type his papers for him and type his notes that were taken by his classmates after doing all of her work, after you know, taking care of him, of her, of, of, of her child, Jane. Um, so we, we really couldn't, you know, we, we took inspiration in her work ethic when we were doing this book, for sure. Cancer has been something that has inf inflected Justice Ginsburg's life. As you may know, she herself has had cancer twice. And yet, with the same kind of stamina that she showed while she was uh, a law student and caring for both her cancer-stricken husband and her uh, daughter, her young daughter at the time, she has never missed a day on the bench. And that actually includes the day after her husband of nearly 60 years passed away from, uh, from cancer in 2010. Even while she was at law school, just down the road from here, um, she, she I, I think getting to law school was the point in which this very studious, quiet young woman hoped that she could finally be seen as an intellectual person who had contributions to offer, and not just as a girl who would get married, get pregnant, and leave the workforce. Um, and she did make law review. She was one of two women to make law review here. You can see her on the right there. Um, they separated the two women in this picture and, and said that they were the two roses amidst the thorns. But even at Harvard Law School, where she had a chance to pursue her interests and her dreams, the first week of law school, the dean summoned all of the women to a dinner. There were nine of them in the class. And they all sat around in a circle. And she was sitting next to a professor who had written a, a fundamental textbook who she described as looking like a god to me. She couldn't have been more thrilled to be at this dinner and more nervous. And the dean, Erwin Griswold, who gave himself a lot of credit for having brought women to the Harvard Law School, looked around and said, now ladies, each of you has to tell me how can you justify taking the place of a man? And Justice Ginsburg was so flummoxed that she stood up. Uh, she had an ashtray. She was a chain smoker at the time. She had an ashtray in her lap. And the ashes scattered everywhere. And when she stood up to answer, she said, I thought it would be good to know what it is my husband does. Erwin Griswold would later say that that question was not meant to be serious, that he was actually just uh, trying to prepare the women for what they would face in the workforce, or that he was just kidding. We don't uh, know about that. There was another woman who answered the question by saying, what better place to catch a man? <laughs> um, but that was not actually what Justice Ginsburg was there to do. 
And what's so interesting about her life is that had she not experienced the kind of discrimination that she did, she might have gone along the path of just becoming a very good lawyer, of just becoming a civil procedure professor. But in fact, because of the ways that she was denied the chance to fulfill her potential, it put her on the path of fighting for justice. Uh, on the left is a photo of Justice Ginsburg and her husband when they were stationed at a military base in Oklahoma. That's when, uh, about a year after they got married, she got pregnant and was working in the civil service while her husband was in the military before law school. And she uh, placed within a certain ranking as a, uh, uh, as a civil servant, but then they found out she was pregnant. And they told her, but you can't travel. She was only three months pregnant. So they demoted her. And when her pregnancy became more advanced, they made it very clear that it was time for her to go. She would later go on to bring important cases in which service members and other women were fired from their jobs, told that they had to get an abortion or quit or just placed on what they called maternity leave, which was unpaid, basically getting kicked out of your job. But it would be a while until she would get to that point. Uh, on the right is a photo of her while she was a professor at Rutgers. 10 years later, she became pregnant again in a happy accident. And still, not having tenure, was afraid to tell her superiors lest she be fired. That's when she went to her mother-in-law's closet and wore baggy clothing. This was a job, by the way, in which she had already been told, well, we couldn't possibly pay you as much as Mr. X because your husband makes a good living. She would later bring a sex discrimination case, class action lawsuit with the other women of Rutgers, and they won. And even before she was a professor, she graduated at the top of her class at Columbia Law, where she was forced to transfer because Harvard Law wouldn't give her a degree um, if she completed her third year at Columbia. So she graduated from Columbia at the top of her class. She was at the top of her class at Harvard Law on both law reviews. And yet still, she was unable to get a job at any law firm. And actually, a professor of hers at Columbia had to bribe, basically, a district court judge in New York to take her on as a clerk. He said, if you don't take on Mrs. Ruth Ginsburg, I will never send you another Columbia clerk again. And that was the stick. The carrot was that if he didn't like her, he, the professor would be able to send a replacement Columbia clerk. A man. A man. But let's just say she did all right. He did not look for a male backup for that role. Um, Ten years later, uh, in the 70s, Justice Ginsburg co-founded the ACLU Women's Rights Project, where her experiences with pay discrimination, pregnancy discrimination, being denied jobs just because she was a woman, were all brought to bear as she built a series of cases that successfully convinced the Supreme Court that women were equal under the law. Something that didn't happen until what the 70s were well underway. It was perfectly legal to treat women as if their contributions in the economic and political spheres mattered less. She brought cases on behalf of men as well as women, which she received criticism about because it was, after all, called the Women's Rights Project. But she knew that in order for there to be true equality and, and liberty for all people, that it, it, her vision of feminism was that you needed to be free to be you and me. So that meant bringing cases on behalf of men who wanted to shatter stereotypes by being primary caregivers for their elderly parents and for their children. In essence, what we've learned is that Justice Ginsburg's version of feminism still has a lot to teach us today. Uh, this is, by the way, a meme from the Beyonce voters uh, Tumblr. We think that one reason that Justice Ginsburg has struck a chord among young people and, uh, and a reason that we're excited to tell people more about her life is because we still have so much unfinished business of gender equality. And the principles for which we thought she fought for, which was, she always said, it's not just women's liberation, it's men's and women's liberation. It also formed the groundwork for her support of LGBT rights. It formed the groundwork of her support for racial justice. 
those are all very much struggles that remain unfinished. And in fact, many of the gains that she fought for are now being rolled back. So I, I think people respond to this sort of righteous passion. And something that we really want to convey through the book, what we really want to uh, tell as a story is how much more there is to her and how deeply committed she remains to the cause of equal citizenship stature. And I think another point is that anyone can be a revolutionary in their own way. And for Justice Ginsburg, that's always been doing the work. Getting angry is a waste of time, as she likes to say. Um, she it, wants you to get to work. Exactly. So after the Notorious RBG meme took off, I actually got a chance to go to Justice Ginsburg's chambers. Um, and uh, for a minute, I didn't know that it was going to happen because she actually had a heart procedure done just a couple weeks before I was supposed to, to go there. And she was, again, she never missed a day on the bench. And we went to her chambers and I asked her how, how she was doing, if she had a message to send to her, uh, to her fans, to her followers. And what she told me was that I could tell them that she'd be back doing push-ups within a week. Anyway, that's all out of us. We would love to take your questions. <laughs> I think that she enjoys it, but she's also uh, a not a very outgoing person in, in, in real life. I think as she's gotten older, she's grown into her role as a public figure. But what's interesting about it is that most of the people that, that know her well, that we've talked to in this process, uh, are, are very surprised by her her role as this icon at this point and and so is she she says she said to think me an icon at 82 um, because she's sort of the least likely person to to, to want that for herself and so that I think, I think that's part of of the appeal is that it's she is this unassuming person um, but she means so much to so many people that said, I think she appreciates it because she really wants to engage as many people as possible in the project of the court and the broader issues that she fought for. So um, one thing that we were surprised to learn when we were reporting the book was that uh, throughout the 80s, when Justice Ginsburg became a lower court judge and left the movement uh, formally, she was repudiated by the feminists of the 80s who said that her focus on equality was uh, ill thought out because it didn't account for how men and women were fundamentally different. And this was, a, it was called difference feminism at the time and the idea was that women spoke in a different voice and that we needed to celebrate the fundamental differences. And something that Justice Ginsburg has always resisted is saying that men and women are essentially one way or another. So I think for now, for her to become the hot young feminist, so to speak, must be, I don't know this, but I, I speculate that, that it is kind of a sweet validation for her. And her clerks also told us uh, that when she's writing and when they're writing on her behalf, she always instructs them to write for the public and to not, and to just think about how to engage people who are outside of the courtroom and whose lives are gonna be affected by this. So I think she's amused and flattered and ultimately anything that engages people more profoundly with her work I believe is something she values. I'm one of the many people who uh, wake up every morning praying for the continued health of Ruth Ginsburg. <laughs> um, I wonder if you could say a couple of words about the contrast between her and Sandra Day O'Connor, the first woman on the Supreme Court, who also faced immense difficulties as a woman and yet developed, of course, a very different judicial philosophy. I'm wondering, is it, well, how do you explain this? Do you think how much of this is, for example, due to Ruth Ginsburg's growing up as a Jew in New York, mm -hmm. um, or other differences in background, or, or why did they, uh, both of them pioneers in certain ways, why did they end up with such different uh, judicial opinions? 
So one thing, so when, for example, when Justice Sotomayor was appointed to the court, she got in some trouble. There was a controversy about a comment she made that said that a wise Latina justice would come to a different conclusion than, uh, say, a white male justice or judge. Um, and Ruth Bader Ginsburg was asked about that comment, and she was quick to defend Justice Sotomayor, then Judge Sotomayor. And she said, well, of course, your life experiences are, are, are very valuable to the decision-making process, but that doesn't mean that they're better or worse. It just means that everything that you've experienced uh, goes into the decision-making process. And I think for her, she valued the differences between her and Sandra Day O'Connor because it showed that women are not all the same, that women can have different opinions, and yet it's important for women to be in the room. One of the most you know, upsetting things for her was when she was the only woman on the bench after Justice O'Connor retired and was replaced by Samuel Alito. Um, I, I do think it's really interesting to think about the differences between them. Um, you know, Linda Hirschman, who we're doing an event with this week, has a great book out that is a dual biography of Justice O'Connor and Justice Ginsburg uh, that we like and appreciate also because it has a chapter in it called Notorious RBG. Uh, and, and Linda argues, I think, that a lot of it had to do with specifically um, the fact that Justice O'Connor grew up as a frontiers woman in this kind of uh, self-reliant mythology of the West. Uh, Justice Ginsburg very much grew up within a tradition of American Jews that was horrified by McCarthyism in particular. While she was a student at Cornell, there were uh, teachers and other members of the community who were blacklisted. So I think that that gave her a deep appreciation for civil liberties. The feminism part came later, but actually what first drew her to the law was the uh, censorship and oppression that was happening within the United States. And it haunted her in particular because uh, her understanding of World War II, uh, which she was born in 1933, was that, was that it had been a war against racism. And then she learned that the troops had been segregated. And then she saw McCarthyism. So I think that shaped her profoundly in addition to all of the gendered uh, experiences that she would have as she grew up and gave her uh, a real strong appreciation for civil liberties. Uh, what's your advice for young people or any person for that matter who don't work in the legal system that could have an impact or voice when it comes to upholding things that we don't want to see go away, like exactly what we were talking about in this, at the start of the talk? Well, I, I think, I mean, from where I'm sitting as a reporter on um, focusing a lot on the battle over reproductive rights, um, that is something, you know, it's not happening in Massachusetts so much, but that, that is something that Justice Ginsburg has talked a lot about in terms of her worry. Um, and I think, I think, honestly, in, in places where it's not such a dire issue, lending support to places where it is a dire issue, if that is something that you support, uh, you know, Justice Ginsburg often talks about how the law is not the engine of social change, it's social movements, and it's people making change through the legislature and through movements. Um, and so I think, I think getting engaged in that process is probably something that she would recommend. Uh, she always says, fight for the things you care about, but do so in a way that would lead others to join you. Um, so I think she wants to see people move beyond, excuse me, move beyond that initial anger and channel it towards something productive. Um, and of course, I, I would say, you know, within your own spheres here, I mean, uh, you know, I saw a lot of awesome things with Google diversity. Of course, we know that, that, uh, that women are still underrepresented in many of these fields and something that she's really committed her life to um, is, is busting stereotypes. You know, the opinion, the majority opinion that she's proudest of is the United States versus Virginia, uh, where she allowed, uh, she wrote the opinion that um, forced the Virginia Military Academy to go co-ed. And she, she, people would say to her, like, oh, like, who would, what woman would want to go to VMI? And she said, you know, there are women who want to go. All that matters is that getting in is not on the basis of your gender. So I, I, I think she would probably encourage people to continue the good work that's being done uh, to get more women and people of color in the STEM fields, since we are at Google. Yeah. Um, 
I was going to ask something similar about what does she consider like her most proud case, which you just mentioned, or um, what she considers maybe the most important case she's worked on or something similar about it, another favorite of hers. Yeah, well, so United States v. Virginia is one of her favorites because it allowed her to actually cite a number of the cases that she argued before the Supreme Court. It was really the culmination of her own legal strategy at the ACLU applying equal protection to gender discrimination. So that was obviously something that she was really proud of. Um, another case that she always mentions is the Lily Ledbetter case, um, which was a case about uh, the the equal uh, about equal pay and in particular she was in the dissent in that case she wrote the dissenting opinion and she basically called out Congress and said you know fix this the, the court has got it wrong here we need you Congress to do something about it luckily at that time for her there was a Democratic Congress and a Democratic president so they actually were able to pass the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act and in her chambers, she has a picture of the signing of that act. And to her, beyond the, the substance of that case itself, the fact that it's about equal pay and how, how obviously important that is um, in her career, in her life, um, it, it also exhibits something that she really cares about, which is the, the value of the institutions and, and, and the interplay between those branches of government. The Supreme Court actually speaking to Congress and Congress responding. And I think, you know, when Arin asked her in Arin's interview with her um, what she thinks about the current Congress, she, she is not so optimistic about the current Congress's ability to, to do that sort of thing, to, to get things done. And I think as a litigator, um, her favorite cases, she, I think there were two favorite cases that I think are worth talking about. And one was um, the case that she thought would guarantee the right to reproductive freedom before Roe v. Wade. And it, for her, it's the case that got away. So Susan Strzok was an Air Force nurse. She became pregnant while on active duty. At that point, the rule was you have to choose. You either have to have an abortion or you have to leave. And this is pretty remarkable because abortion was still illegal throughout the United States, but the Army was actually requiring female service members to have abortions if they wanted to stay in their jobs. So Justice Ginsburg represented Susan Strzok in a brief to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court took the case, and her argument was that it violates a woman's equal protection under the law to say that she has to uh, treat her pregnancy in a particular way or another. If she can take disability leave, she should be treated just like a man who needs disability leave. And only women are punished for having sex. That was sort of the bottom line of, of her argument. And she hoped that by bringing a case of a woman who didn't want to have an abortion, just like the male cases that she brought uh, that were also about vindicating women's rights, that she would be able to uh, lay the groundwork that would eventually lead to the full range of reproductive options. Um, but Erwin Griswold, the same dean who had demanded of her that she justify her presence, happened to be the solicitor general, the top lawyer for the United States of America, and went to the military and said, you've got to change this policy because I'm going to lose this case. <laughs> yeah, this guy pops up again and again in her life. We also have this very mansplaining letter that we quote in the book from him where he starts to worry, roughly in 1978, that white men aren't going to be able to get into Harvard Law School anymore. Uh, she assures him that there will always be a place of, for white men with merit. <laughs> so the Strzok case ended up being mooted um, and as a result, in that same term, Roe v. Wade was decided. Uh, so Justice Ginsburg always sort of bemoans Roe v. Wade because she feels it went too far too fast. Even though she liked the outcome, she thought that something grounded in women's equality would be better. And the other case that she loves, her favorite client, who she stayed in touch with for years, uh, started with a letter to the editor. And it was a man who had recently lost his wife. She had died in childbirth, but the child survived. And he wanted to be the primary caregiver for his son. But he could not get the same widower benefits that a widow could get. And the letter says, I wonder if Gloria Steinem knows about this. This is 1976. And, uh, Gloria Steinem did, in fact, I think, know about it. And Justice Ginsburg, then the head of the ACLU Women's Rights Project, 
soon learned about it and brought his case all the way up to the Supreme Court, arguing that it violated his rights, his dead wife's rights as a breadwinner, uh, and the rights of the child to equal protection under the law. And the justices at the time, all men, had trouble even believing that a man would want to care for their child. Like They were like, is this case real? Are you serious? Who is this guy? Uh, but she, she won, and she stayed in touch with uh, Stephen Weisenfeld for years, and many years later, she performed his son's wedding. Great. Well, thank you guys so thank much. Thank you so much for coming.